Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Shift Work, a podcast made in collaboration with RWCF and HRN, we're shifting the conversation about how the restaurant food you love makes its way to the table. Listen to and follow Shift Work on your favorite podcast app. Hello, welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one of your hosts, Darren Bresnitz. Hope everyone out there is staying safe and sane. Taking time to check in with yourself and your loved ones. We are super excited to be joined by Thomas and Ryan. Flower and Water up in San Francisco. Fantastic Italian restaurant that we've known about for a decade. Probably one of the first San Francisco restaurants that ever came on our radar. They have a new cookbook out called Flower and Water Pasta. If you've ever wanted to make pasta or you are old hat to it or even just medium hat, it's a great guide. Uh, great resource and a lot of inspiration. If you ever just fantasized about making pasta with Nona's in Laboratorio in Bologna, it's a fantastic read. We talk about the book, the process of making it, their treating of Northern California as another region of Italy, and the reopening of Flower and Water February 10th this week. It's a great listen. Really appreciate them making the time. And then we go to the other side of the world, New Zealand, sit down with How to Escape Reality, talk about starting a band right before the pandemic, their EP and Christmas single from last year, and their hungry, hungry desire to play their first live show. It's really great. A lot of early 2000s, late 90s influences from the band that I love in the best possible way. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy Snacky Tunes here on HRN.org. We talk about food, we talk about music, with musical dudes, finger on the pulse, snacky tunes.
Thomas, Ryan, welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedules. And congratulations on Flower and Water Pasta Cookbook. It is a beaut. Oh, cool. Thanks for having Thanks us, man. To be here. Thanks for having us. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you're going to remember this, Thomas, but we met a decade ago. Uh, okay. I had done a food and music festival called Noisette in San Francisco, and you were one of the chefs because Flower and Water was one of the first restaurants I'd heard about of like this new generation of restaurants while I was living in New York. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And uh, it's been incredible to watch you guys, especially with the popularity of Italian food, homemade pasta, but just your general growth as a restaurant and the evolution. And it's you know, you've done something that few restaurants do, especially now, has been in existence for over a decade. It's crazy. Um, you know, we're, I, I really feel like we're we're super fortunate 13 years later to, to be here, you know? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and I know that pasta has been a driving force and a, the Italian ethos has been a driving force. But I want to go back because I know that you're an East Coaster as well. You grew up in New Jersey and, and – Look, we. I, I try Philly. to hide that, man. I try to hide that as much as I can. <laughs> I know, and it's easy to write off the red sauce checker uh-huh. tablecloth that we grew up with. But is there anything from those early East Coast Italian days that you still love, that you're still fond of, that has I don't want to say full circle food journey, but like pushed you into working into Italian food and the Italian ethos even For today? Sure. For sure. I mean, I was like. I joke around that I've been trying to run away from Jersey my entire <laughs> adult life. Uh, and, and part of the reason why I moved out to San Francisco was it was just the farthest place I, I could move from Jersey. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of came up in fine dining restaurants. Mm-hmm. And there's definitely, for me, um, there's this removal from your hands-on experience, right? And it's like the traveling through Italy, my mind was blown how um how much culture played a role in food both in like families but also of restaurants as well um and just became obsessed with with italian food as far as how it relates to culture and feeding people and and also just getting your hands in there rolling out fresh pasta for mozzarellas and Mm. um uh, so come full circle so there's also this huge correlation with with bay area and the, the sensibility around food around here um, and being able to visit every farm that we, that we purchase from and, and the access to food that we have out here um, come full circle. Now me and Ryan are running fine water pasta shop where yeah. the whole menu is, is hoagies, you know, uh, and I'm I know. Like, Holy shit. I've been running away from Jersey and now we're, now we're just cooking, slinging Jersey hoagies. Um, I had to take a deep dive in the culinary education of Philly cuisine, um, which, Darren, when you mentioned you were from Philly, I was thinking you got to come up and try the hoagies. Don't tempt me with a good time. I'll be yeah. on the train tomorrow. I mean, you know, it's uh, there's an art. And it's funny because if you've never had a really good Philly hoagie, you're like, oh, the layering, the proportions don't matter. And I'm like, it's literally only it's about, about that about. and the bread. It's all yeah, it's yeah, about. Yeah. Tom that put me on a, a hunt for the perfect bread. And uh, I've visited Jersey and we've done an event in Philly together before. And so uh, I, I kind of knew what I was looking for, but I kept bringing back samples for, for him to try. And uh, we, we finally landed on this new bakery in Pacifica called mm. Rosalind. And uh, they've, they've nailed the formula. And it's, I, I truly it's insane that that we it's have like, the right bread now. I mean, it in, it's in, it's insane how good this bread is. And I would put it. You put an extra Amorosa. There's no, there, look. There's no hiding the bread. If you have a good, if you have the good bread, you have everything. Yeah, totally for sure. So we did Amorosa. We played around with it against you know totally polar opposite of what we try to do the ethos in the restaurant flying out frozen bread sure. all the way from the, the east coast but we tried it and when you amoroso rolls they're just not the same when you fly them out here and like the shelf life of them and just like the whole thing and when i eat an amoroso roll i am transported back to childhood 
And it's yep. not like it, it's just a texture that cannot be achieved out here. But Rosalind, uh, the the bakery that we get, so they're they're sesame seeded. It's crazy. It's crazy how good they are. And it's just a different. It's a different beast. It makes it. It elevates the sandwich to a whole different level. Yeah. Um, now I know both of you spent time cooking in Europe. Uh, Thomas, you did France and. Ryan, you've done Spain, but you guys have also spent time staging and cooking in Italy. Every country has its different approach to food. Every, you know, I would say French is probably the most classic, like what you think of, of like the toques and the tradition. What was it like learning and cooking in Italy? How did that change your experience of taking that back? Because this was years ago. This is so long ago. What did you learn from there that you wanted to bring back to America that you weren't seeing at the time? I mean, for me, I kind of touched base on it, but coming from, so I, I was staging, I went to Germany, lived there for a month, um, uh, staged at this like, uh, 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 kind of French inspired, but, uh, two star Tantris, um, and going into these environments, you know, mm. the kitchen environments and especially like higher end restaurants, it's super unique, right? You don't see this right. in a lot of different professions, um, and I loved, I, I loved the joint joining a kitchen for me was like joining a baseball team. You know, there's mm. this like camaraderie and like, you know, it's just like being on, on a sports team. That's what attracted me when I was 14 years old. Um, and a little bit of the pirate ship esque, you know, nature sure. of them. Um, but working with your hands and being able to create. Right. So the combination of like sports team creation, creativity, and working with your hands and developing food. So seeing that all over Europe, you know, again, it was about how it relates to different cultures and this food being this um, common thread. You know, everyone experiences food, maybe on different levels, but everyone experiences uh, it. And so it's just fascinating to me how it's this door, this window into a culture. And Ooh. that to me was so important to my foundation as a person, not mm. as a chef, you know, being able oh, to wow. travel, being able to travel the world and, yeah. and like go into kitchens and not necessarily speak the language, but have, you know, be able to speak through words or uh, through actions and working next to people. It's this common food language. Um, and, and dialogue is created from that, you know, that taught me so much as a person and a human being that certainly impacts profession and, and, and being a chef so and ryan what did you take away from the kitchens you spent in what were you seeing in europe that you weren't seeing in america that changed you so i uh, uh similar to tom went to europe chasing the uh the michelin starred pellegrino top 50 list of course. dreams of fine dining um and uh, to be honest with you i didn't have any italian cooking experience and I hadn't even been to Italy until I started the interview process with Tom, which is hmm. uh, over 10 years ago now. And so I went before starting at Flower and Water to uh, spend some time, hit uh, Emilia Romagna, Tuscany, Lazio. And for me, the big takeaway was they're, they're doing exactly what we're doing in California. They've just been doing it longer, meaning <laughs> hyper seasonality. Uh, showing off core products on the plate and not masking it. And, you know, what What Alice Waters brought to, to us here in California, the Italians have been doing it for centuries and generations. And that was a big takeaway for me, where it's like, focus on that core product, celebrate it when it's at its peak of its season, and then move on. When me and Ryan first let, uh, met, there was this common language of being fascinated with tradition, like old world traditions, uh, and being able to put our own twist on things. And I think anything like if you really understand the history behind something, you're able to then use it in a different way. Mm. Um, and, and I think that was really important for the both of us as like a, a foundational cooking, um, and how that involves with traditions. Um, to how do we put our, tw our twist on it? You know, you don't see a lot of avocados in Italy, but we're in California. So can we treat that avocado the same way that they treat, uh, uh, you know? 
I mean, I don't – cheating isn't the right word, but you guys get to do something that isn't really done in Italy because if you've traveled around Italy, like when you're in Bologna, that is the type of cuisine you're getting. Tuscany, sure. agrarian coast, like you're getting the, a type of pesto there that is that – Singular type of pesto. And even sure. in the book, you, you talk about, like, this is Linguarian pesto. It's like what you think of with the basil and the pine nuts and things like that. But you guys say that you treat – you think of Northern California as like another region of Italy. But the difference is is that you get to then bring in all these different ingredients and mix all these different cultures and cuisines from Italy. But I guess what you're saying is that that freedom – to mix that and to have the, 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 I guess, confidence to do it comes from understanding the tradition and the stories of where it actually sure. comes from. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We are sneaking fish sauce way too many places <laughs> that you don't even know about. You know, just, I just got my red palette. boat. It's going in everything. Yeah. 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 But then you, yeah, you do fun. the deep dive into the history of food like we, we obsess over and you realize that, you know, uh, Vietnamese and Thai fish sauce comes from Roman garum, and yep. so there's this Thai yeah. back to Italy. Yeah, but I and mean, the nice thing about cooking on flour and water is we're we're not handcuffed by uh, regional or family tradition with our pasta program. Those handcuffs are tight in Italy. Our box to work out of is so much bigger. You will not hear an Italian say Italian food. It just doesn't mm. – it does not exist. Nobody in Italy is saying, oh, that's Italian food. No, they're saying that's food from Liguria. That is Emilia Romagna cuisine. You know, Italian food is uh, uh, is like an American phrase, you know. And then to your point earlier, Italian-American is this whole other different thing. Italian-American is this is, – is a new style of food that has not been around for uh, 500 years, you know. But I think now in reading the book and 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 having spent time in Italy, Italian American did in so many ways what even like Chinese American or other types of cuisines where it became a postmodern greatest hits of things that you would never see. Even Japanese restaurants, when you go to Japan, it's like they just you just go there and you get tonkatsu. That's all they have. That it's right, just like right, one right. dish that's even more specific. And you look at the Italian restaurants, especially Italian American, where y- you go like, "Oh, here's pesto next to Lagunio Vangole, like it's you know next to Parmesan, next to Bolognese, which it would never happen." Um, totally. And you guys have found a way to to take the best of that postmodern approach and do your research and then filter it through the north uh, Northern California cuisine and make it its own its own special type of of approach to cooking. Totally, and I think it's really mm-hmm. important that. Um, I think we realized early on that if you take a, a, a trattoria that's in the middle of Rome and mm-hmm. you pick it up literally brick by brick and make the same exact establishment in San Francisco, it would not do that well. And if you took flour and water mm. and you picked it up and you put it in the middle of Rome, it probably we not received very well. And so we do have to understand like where we are and where we're cooking. And, mm. you know, maybe Italian food, m- maybe different um, cuisines, you know, some cuisines texture is very, very different than what an American palate likes. So, so that's like a hyper example of it. Um, but I do think it's important to realize that we are cooking in San Francisco. Um, and that whether our guests through like their palates or whatever different, you know, culture or, you know, it, it has to be, we have to cook for, for, for our guests. And I think, we realized that early on and flour and water has a unique or interesting twist on most things. It's not just, we don't just do the classic Ligurian pesto. We're always yeah. in thought of saying, okay, how do we, how do we tweak that just a little bit to make it, to make it ours, you know? And the, the way we write our menus, it, it starts with, uh, you know, it's kind of cliche now, but uh, we start with farmer's market, sure. and farm direct lists, and so we see something like uh, wild nettles hitting a, a farmer's list for the first time. And then our brain goes to pesto. Mm. And it's not, hey, uh, we want to do a pasta with pesto. What kind of pesto do we want to make? And, and that's the most fun part of writing the flour and water menu offerings is it's reverse engineering and starting with well, what do we got? Yeah, when you get that, uh, what is it, asparagus two weeks text, your brain starts spinning. 
uh, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In, in a direction. Um, you know, going back to the regionality of Italy, uh, everyone has, I think, their own favorite region. I think you can like all of them. There's not a bad region. And in the Bologna gets a lot of love uh, in the book. Um, and you talk about, you know, you sort of said this, uh, Ryan, uh, about like you're chasing this Michelin stars, you're going to Europe, you think you got to go one way. But Ryan, uh, but Thomas, what I got from you is that like what you really learned the most from was the Laboratorio um, at Bruno and Franco. Um, can you talk about what that is, who you learned under there, and how how that experience really, I think, to me, seemed like to change everything that you learned about cooking from Italy and like how it inspired the restaurant. For sure, man. I, I, I got so lucky. And yeah. like through my travels and I didn't know um, at the time, I didn't necessarily know where I was traveling to next. And um, I, I was in Germany and at this Tantris and I was staying in basically like a dorm. And that room, I had to leave in, in over, a, uh, I was only able to be there for a month and I had to leave because someone else was signed up for the dorm room. And mm-hmm. so I had to move to Italy and I'm like just emailing everybody and found out about Bruno e. Franco in the middle of Bologna. And it's an old, what they call a pasta laboratorio. And it sounds way different than it actually is. A pasta laboratorio is like five wooden tables and mm-hmm. mozzarella rolling pins and that's it. And, um, most shops, so Bruno Franco is a Salum Maria, and most shops in um, in Bologna have a pasta laboratorio that's attached to them that produce all of the all of the pasta. And I rented an apartment, not even knowing, found an apartment on Craigslist, and it was from this <laughs> uh, from from a character of an Italian man who actually ran what's called Blue One. And Blue mm. One is a culinary tour guide, and sure. it's just him. Uh, uh, it's just him and his wife in a car, and they're just taking people around. And he's so like Perfect. deeply rooted in in um, uh, in the in the producers there. And so mm-hmm. I, I basically get off a plane. I go there. Um, I'm eating. I'm eating with their family. They're like rolling out the red carpet and, and cooking all this amazing food. The next couple of days, all of a sudden, I'm in like uh, balsamic uh, uh, attics where where they're mm. producing balsamic vinegar, taking me to Parmesan Reggiano um, producers, and and like being able to see all those artisans. Sure. And then all of a sudden, I'm I'm connected with Bruno Franco and being able to work in their laboratorio, which is just twelve old ladies, old nonas that are Amazing. rolling. They looked at me like who the hell is this baby? Like, who is this kid? <laughs> you know, t- typically they're staffed by, um, by women, you know, so you don't see a lot right. of, a lot of males in, in, in there. And they're like, who is this guy? And, uh, who's this like baby? Who's this kid? And to be able to spend a couple of months with them is like, it was, it was definitely, it was life altering. And yeah, like the, the, um, the, 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 artisanship that goes into rolling by mozzarella and producing the pasta and then doing it day in and day out. And just the muscle memory that goes along with that. And like the refinement of the craft is, uh, was crazy fascinating to me. Um, which is so funny because it's the antithesis of what you think of, which is of staging in Europe, which is usually male driven, young, guys and girls who are trying to, I don't know, take away something or just add another line to the resume. And this was just like, you're learning. And again, let's, let's date this back into like the late aughts because now it's like you have pasta grannies and things like that on YouTube and it's it's sort of become norm. But back then the idea of going to like Bologna, going to a, a, a room with no cooking equipment, and saying that's what's going to change your life with cooking, it's yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, bef- I staged uh, for a month in this um, in a three star um, in Paris, and it sure. was the typical Parisian yeah. three star. I there mean, you go. rolled up elbows, cur- you know, everyone's <laughs> cursing at each other. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wouldn't tell. They wouldn't tell me any of the recipes. You know, sure. I was like stealing the the, the recipes, right. and, and to go from that to to this was. Uh, was super u- unique and, and special, you know? Um, 
and hysterical. I mean, they're, they're like 12 crazy old grannies that are, uh, hysterical. And, and I, I, it's so funny because I had this, like the wrong mentality going into it. Mm. Like they are so not the wrong mentality, but I would ask questions being like, they were, they could not make enough pasta and they only worked from Just- seven to two. And I'm like, in my mentality, I'm like, well, well, how come you guys don't work till three? You, you can make, yeah. like, we, dude, we work till two. I'm we like, but till two. if you work till three, you can make more, like you could sell more. And then like, like, no, no, we work till two. That's it. <laughs> you know, we got kids to go pick up. We got to yeah, go cook yeah. at home. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's, all right, the way of a, it's, it is a, it's a nice way of life. Seven to two yeah. sounds pretty good. Uh, all right, let's just get a quick musical break. And then we come back. I want to talk, get more into the book. Uh, we have a song from the archives here on Snacky Tunes on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. We took a breath from the same world. We saw same summer skies We took a breath from the same world and got lost in the wonderful time I stood in front of my old home I searched my mind for tired I let the death from the ground grow I let it all go I don't have much But I have enough So don't feel so You still have love Hello and welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We are here with Thomas and Ryan of Flower and Water. Their new book, Flower and Water Pasta, out on 10 Speed Press, is a beautiful book, a real love letter to pasta. Um, but I have to ask, because Flower and Water is more than just a pasta restaurant. Why did you want to dedicate this book, this first book, to pasta? How does it represent the whole entire ethos of the restaurant and the restaurant group? So we, um, when we first opened up, 
um, we didn't know necessarily that the pasta was going to be kind of the, the heart of the menu. Um, and actually our guests kind of slowly dictated that. And over the first couple of months, um, you know, we had a really tiny service kitchen downstairs at the time and a small little table to produce pasta on it. Um, coming from Bologna, I knew that I wanted to incorporate more, you know, um, uh, elaborate more in the, the pasta section. We actually ended up creating a dough room behind the restaurant where we produced, so kind of st- actually stylized after Bruno or Franco, the, the pasta mm. laboratory there. So it has a massive center butcher block. It's like 14 by six feet in length uh, um, that we roll all of our, our pastas on. So we kind of went all in at that point and we're like, mm-hmm. we want the, the heart of this menu. Then it evolved saying, okay, let's put a pasta tasting menu. So we can, mm. you know, we, we can have a menu that's focused on five different textures of pasta. Um, and so it just kind of grew from there. And then we, we wanted to evolve it even more and um, to be able to do more research and, and, um, and evolve that kind of grew into the, into the book. And so we're kind of like naturally writing it side by side mm. before sure. we even, you know, and now R- Ryan um, kind of spearheaded a, a project in the, so our restaurant has its own kind of like pasta Bible where there's a ridiculous amount of like um, documented shapes, textures, you know, we use it for both back and front, you know, history. And so, so kind of the book naturally evolved from, from the dough room for the, the restaurant. I have to imagine that with all the different iterations over the years, especially being market driven, that there's so many pasta recipes that didn't make it into the book or maybe oh, pasta sure. recipes that, when you go back through this Bible, you're like, oh, yeah, we did that this year. Um, yeah, how did you totally. how did you curate it? How did you call it down? Is it a mix of crowd favorites where like if, you know, if I bought this book because I'm a huge fan, I'm going to want this recipe in the book? Or was it just saying like these are just the best of the best? Um, it's a great question. Uh, you, you know, I think I – we, we wanted to, to make a book that we were proud of in front of our peers – Mm. And pasta is not an easy thing. Like, you know, if you make a book about grilling, most people interact with grilling. Well, I don't if you're a vegetarian or you love steaks, most people sure. interact with grilling. And some, not a lot of people in America produce their own pasta, right? No. And so it, it, it can be scary uh, subject. And we were really, we had a lot of people pushing us to make like an at-home pasta book. And I think maybe just because of my young, dumb ego, I was like, nah, I want something that that, uh, that our peers would be proud of. Um, and so it did. It started with like kind of the, what we thought was the best of the best from the restaurant. Um, our menu changes every day. So like, right. and, and we like to say like our menu is like almost like guitar solos where we don't put a dish <laughs> on and it stays that way and it's on the menu. For, it like it changes. So like if we put a dish on the menu 10 days later, it may have changed 10 times and like little tweak, little tweak, little tweak. And then all of a sudden day 10, it's a radically different, uh, different pasta. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we try to not, you know, I, I feel like there's two main thoughts in restaurants. It's like make the dish and then practice it and then make it the same every single day in and day out. And that's just so fair. fucking boring to me. You also know? fair. And we want, we, we want our cooks to like really like, you know, one, they're there for a learning experience for at, at the forefront. And um, there's something that goes with if you're changing the menu every day, you're analyzing every single thing about that dish. And that creates like it sounds cheesy, but there's a little bit of soul behind it. Mm-hmm. Like a little like that healthy tension that like makes you analyze that dish every single day, I, I, I think makes it. And we're, we're OK with failure, you know. As long as, yeah. as long as we, we, we treat it, you know, in a way that it doesn't necessarily affect our guests. Uh, right. But. Right. Because I think in the book, it shows a lot of the experimentation and you guys are very open about trying something four or five or six or seven different ways before you get something that makes it out of the kitchen and onto the plate. Yeah. Totally. Um, you also talk about how, in addition to your pasta program, you have a pretty healthy pork program whole animal uh, butchery. Ryan, how do those two go hand in hand? Um, 
especially starting in your smaller days when you're talking about butchering in the middle of the dining room to now, which seems like a, a full fledged oh, offering of, of charcuterie and, and different, you know, all cuts of animal. Yeah. The, the whole animal butchery program that we have is emblematic of so much of what we've already talked about now. One uh, Italian cooking mentalities where you're utilizing and honoring an entire animal, whether it's a pig, lamb, veal or other. Um, and uh, two, that creativity and constant evolution of the menu and not set menu items. Meaning mm. uh, one day the, the shoulder of a, a pig might be braised in whey for, for a certain pasta. And there's only two shoulders to that pig. So on, on day threes and four, we're trying to figure out what kind of... Uh, uh, ground product we can turn into a sausage right. or right. here as salumi and forcing ourselves to not bring in fabricated cuts is such a driving force of that ever evolving menu that we we strive to have and it it makes our life as chefs uh, harder because we're we're constantly having to pivot but but that pressure really breeds creativity mm -hmm. and that's why the food at flower and water uh to me it, it's always so alive is because of that mm. ever changing ever evolving um having to be nimble and and strategic uh it, it makes for something very special and you know with uh italy's uh tradition of salumi and curing mm -hmm. uh, and us adopting that it allows us to run the full animal program and uh, and plan for future creativity. You know, carrying a culatella, a cup from the, the back leg of a pig, you know, you've got three months to, to think about what you're going to do with that that piece of salumi. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's also good business practice as well because you know that you're going to have to get through – a whole animal, you're going to have to use everything. And it's just, it's a more effective way to think about how are you running the business of the restaurant, which you guys talk about in the book as well, um, from early on and throughout. Um, how is the business of pasta? How is it these days? Because it well, is a labor intensive, ingredient driven, you know, type of endeavor and I only bring it up because you mention it quite a few times uh, throughout the stories that you tell about you've always been thinking about it beyond the food, but as running a restaurant as as a small to larger business. Well, after the pandemic, myself and Ryan are going back to college. We're going to get real grown up jobs. We're going. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that, I mean it, that uh, the MBA LSAT yeah. looking real nice, right? <laughs> um. You know, it, it, it's interesting. It's just an interesting kind of loaded question right now. Um, uh, we just went through a restaurant opening. Uh, so we opened mm -hmm. Penny Roma. Um, Congrats. Uh, thanks. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting. So we shut down Flower and Water um, mm -hmm. to open Penny Roma um, because of the, the labor pool that's out there right now is, is a really challenging one. And so we actually mm -hmm. shut down the flagship restaurant to take all of our staff across the street and then build this mm -hmm. new this new restaurant. And Flower and Water went through a remodel. Um, cool. And it's it's opening uh, hopefully in two weeks, which is a whole different stressful uh, uh, thing. Um, but you know, the uh, the the whole animal represents two things: one being financially uh sound in being able to utilize a product 100 percent. so all of the off cuts all of the bones all of the skin can we make take a skin from a, a 350 pound pig and make the most delicious chicharrones that we've ever had and, and incorporate mm -hmm. them onto the menu um more so all of our cooks that come to us are coming for an education. They're not just coming for, for a paycheck. They want to come mm -hmm. learn and then go get a better job. 
right? It's just, mm-hmm. just like going to school, apprenticeship, you know? Um, and so we've created this like dynamic program to be able to attract talented to cooks because they want to break down that whole pig. They want to see it. They want to learn, you know, those, those traditional ways. And so, um, as it relates to like the pasta program, it's great for us because we want our restaurants to be accessible. We don't want to price, you know, it's like we are trying to, to balance. And I think a lot of restaurants are doing this coming out of the pandemic saying, the model for, for traditional restaurants is a difficult one financially. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. most if most people knew what margins restaurants are, are making, they, they'd be pretty shocked. Um, we can set up through a pasta program and through a whole animal butchery program. There's a lot more things in our favor. And I'll give the example of like if you have uh, – we get these really, really beautiful, very expensive rabbits – at Mm -hmm. the restaurant Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. we're not just taking that rabbit roasting it and serving it on a plate it'd be a ridiculously expensive entree right (laughs) but we can take we can take a portion of that rabbit and braise the shoulders and the legs and then incorporate that with a with a noodle Mm. um and we're, we're 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 making so we're probably only serving roughly three ounces of, yeah. uh, braised with that, but from the stock and the four or five, it makes this really, really beautiful, affordable dish from, from right. a quite expensive product. And so, um, uh, you know, again, I think from that, you know, looking at through that lens, you, you have to be creative mm-hmm. It forces creativity, you know, through that lens. And so, um, it makes, it makes the, the, um, the financials of the restaurant a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit softer. And a lot, that's a lot, not a lot of people I feel like want to talk about that. I think money is like a taboo topic. I, I, um, I agree. I, most that, people do not want to talk about the business of running a restaurant. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And I think maybe the, the, and I hate to keep bringing up the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has slightly shifted or put a magnifying glass on, on people's perspectives on, around the financials of restaurants. Um, and, you know, San Francisco, there's, it's expensive place to, to, to do business, you know? And I think what's important when we say sustainable restaurant, you know, it's not just the products that we choose. It's not just the the right fish that we want to bring into the restaurant or the, the pasture raised pork and whole pig uh, or whole butchery program. Sustainable restaurant means that we're able to pay our bills. It means that mm-hmm. we're able to pay our employees or they're, they're, we're not, you know, our employees aren't worried about getting getting paid. And so that sustainable model has to ring throughout. And that certainly relates to, to the financials. Um, and that, that's something from, from day one we took really, really, really seriously. Um, and um, uh, working with our like kind of flexible models to be able to put a product that's, that we're really proud of, but we're not charging an arm and a leg for you know, like that balance is, is always really, really difficult to, to achieve. You know, again, our pasta program and our whole animal butchery allows us a little bit more of a, of a leeway into that. Mm. You know, we, we don't, we don't, it's supposed to, fire and water is supposed to be for, for, for everybody. And we don't want to have this, um, uh, you know, we want it to be accessible. Uh, mm. And that means that we're not going to, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be this fifty dollar entree. We're really trying really, really hard to to do business in San Francisco and not make it a fifty dollar entree. Of course, but, you know and it, it always takes balance. Made in, the moves we've made in the last two years have uh, have really amplified that wanting to be something for everyone. Um, when the pandemic first hit and we uh, opened up the flour and water pasta shop, it was our opportunity to provide uh, our flour and water guests with pasta that they can cook in their own home as they were sheltering in place and give them a, an at home version of it. And that led to uh, pasta production um, kind of doubling down on, on what we do. And from that came Penny Roma, which is uh, an even more accessible uh, style of restaurant compared to flour and water. Mm. And uh, we're really trying to provide uh, a little bit of something for everyone, especially in our, our neighborhood and our backyard here in, in the Mission District. I think um, 
it's a beautiful sentiment and it's echoed in the book, especially in the early pages when you say you have flour, you have water, if you can get eggs, you can make pasta, you can eat, you can make a great yeah. meal. Yeah. Um, and while it can be intimidating, uh, you do sort of talk about this approach of depende quanto basta, which is like, you got to feel it out. You got to make it. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, I'd like to end with advice from guys who have been making pasta, could do it in their sleep for people who are going to pick up this book, who want to do something, who might want to create dishes from the restaurant. What is your advice in making pasta at home with or without Uh, this guide? I mean, the guide helps. The book helps a lot. But if I'm just like, all right, I got flour, I got water, I got, you know, I got some eggs. It's such a perfect question to end on because Tom and I lately have been almost obsessively talking about there's there's really just a handful of things that anyone can do while cooking pasta that's going to really significantly enhance the, the finished product. Um, first one, salting your water and boiling your pasta in enough water is something that it seems so simple, but a lot of pasta recipes and really any dried pasta you buy from uh, from the market doesn't have salt in it because it goes through these bronze dyes and it would be corrosive. Mm-hmm. And so heavily salted pasta water, tip one, basically about a, a heaping tablespoon per quart of water and making sure that you have enough water that that pasta is at a, a ripping boil the entire time it's cooking in there. Uh, number two, uh, finishing, uh, finishing your noodles or your filled pastas in the sauce. Like Tom and I both grew up in households that cooked similarly. And, uh, uh, my parents hated hearing this the first time I said it in an interview, but I'll do it again. I feel like I was culinarily abused as a child where, uh, cooking was definitely not part of our, our family tradition. Um, my, my parents did a great job of pro- providing dinner every night, but uh, cooking was not their strong suit. And At what cost? At, that, At like, what cost? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, when we had pasta, it was boil noodles, drain them. All that water went down the sink, separately heat up a sauce, and then ladle that sauce on top of the portions of pasta. Mm-hmm. Where if you don't have that marriage of, of pasta and sauce – you're really missing out on uh, an opportunity for a more uh, special experience. And so finishing your, uh, your noodles in the sauce and using a little bit of that pasta water as, as seasoning, but also there's those free flowing starch in that pasta water that's going to help emulsify a sauce and give you a better uh, mouthfeel and help that uh, cling to the noodle. And, uh, and really that's it, you know, is. Yeah. That trick of adding semolina flour to the boiling, um, pasta water was something I hadn't heard before and, and I'll be banking it for the next time of, yeah. uh, of, we have of massive, seeing how that, that takes up my pasta game. Yeah. So we, we have massive tanks that obviously we have two massive tanks at, at fire and water. It's where we boil all of our pastas. That starchy water is constantly incorporated into the sauce. Yeah. Um, and that helps stabilize butter sauces. It helps stabilize and kind of enrich in um, uh, meat-based ragus. And so um, starchy water is important. I, I would say, honestly, just start fucking making pasta. Yeah. Like like schedule the time. And, and even like through the pandemic, I know people might be a little sick of cooking at home. But if you, if you make pasta and, and if certainly like with kids, they're going to mm-hmm. be so enamored with it. Uh, and, and whenever they're, they're a part of something or, or even you're a part of something in, in cooking it, it's going to taste 10 times better than you would of it coming out of a box. And the more that you practice, the faster you're going to get. I think it, it, pasta doesn't take this like crazy amount of time. Um, if, if you have, if you have half an hour to cook, you, you, you can make a, a damn good noodle, um, to, to boil. Amazing. Well, listen, guys, congratulations. Looking forward to the reopening, getting back up to San Francisco, having 
a meal with you guys. The book is Flour and Water Pasta out on Ten Speed Press. If people want to follow along um, about the Flour and Water Hospitality Group or any of the restaurants, where can they go to check everything out? Uh, Flour and Water uh, Hospitality Group uh, dot com. So I think it's fwhospitality.com. Um, and you can see all, all the restaurants there. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, congratulations again. We have a song from the archives and then a live performance here on Snacky Tunes on heritageradio.org. Hi, I'm Kiki Luya, the Executive Director of Restaurant Workers Community Foundation, and I'm the host of a new podcast called Shift Work. In the last six months, some 6,500 restaurants have closed their doors, and there's never been a time when restaurants and their 12 million workers have been more vulnerable. It's time to transform hospitality. With Shift Work, a podcast made in collaboration with RWCF and HRN, We're shifting the conversation about how the restaurant food you love makes its way to the table. What does it really take to make that experience happen? And who are the countless workers responsible? 
We're talking porters, cleaning crew, prep cooks, servers, baristas, hosts, bartenders, barbacks, managers, sommeliers, and chefs. I'll also introduce you to organizations that are leading industry transformation. We'll discuss mental health, fair pay, racial justice, and how hospitality can change for the better. We need it. Listen to and follow Shift Work on your favorite podcast app. Sam, hello. Welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thank you for joining us all the way from New Zealand. How are Hi. you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. It's it's uh, it's great to ha- to uh, to have you on. Um, I recently saw that you guys had to postpone your next show at Bay Rock mm-hmm. because of COVID and Omicron. So I just want to check in before we get into everything. How you guys doing? I, I saw the PM even canceled her wedding. So I guess you guys are all in in this together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been an interesting situation with COVID here because. I guess the goal here has been to keep it out of the country as much as possible. And so when COVID gets in New Zealand at all, everything kind of shuts down a bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think this year we were all hopeful that it wouldn't really happen. But turned out, yeah, a couple of weeks before our gig, we moved into a level red, which essentially means no gatherings over 100, even with vaccine passports and stuff. So mm. a festival like Bay Rock just can't, can't happen. So. Yeah, a little bit of a different uh, approach than what's happening here stateside. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know too much about what's happening over there, but it, I see pictures on Instagram of bands that I follow like doing gigs all the time. Yeah, you, you and me both, and I go, huh? Okay, wow. Yeah, nary a mask in sight. Okay, all right, mm-hmm. there we go. Um, all right, so let's not focus all on COVID and the pandemic, but it's. <laughs> You're, it's interesting because the lifespan of your band sort of is actually tied to. I mean, you formed yeah. more or less in the beginning of 2020. Yeah. So the funny thing is that we haven't actually been able to play a live show yet. <laughs> Every you're time you're practicing, still in the garage, yeah, still, yeah. <laughs> still working on it. Yeah. This Bay Rock one was going to be our first one, um, just because every time we go to plan a show, COVID then comes in and we can't do one for however many months. You know, um, which is frustrating. Um, but yeah, no, our band is the origin of our band is interesting because at the start it was kind of just me because um, I'd wanted to be in a band since I was a kid. Mm. Um, but after moving country when I was 18, I found it hard to find the right people to be in a band with. And so I ended up just releasing that EP that we have out just by myself at the beginning of 2020. Um, and then after that, I asked my wife and my brother to help me, like, play some shows. But yeah, like I said, that <laughs> hasn't actually happened yet. <laughs> now you grew up. You grew up in China, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what was your family doing there, and uh, what do you remember of your time there? What do you remember from eating during your time there? Um. Well, yeah. So my parents were initially kind of like studying language and stuff over there, and then mm. worked. So my dad did lots of translation stuff. He worked on a like a three way three way three three language dictionary, uh, Tibetan, wow. Chinese, and English. Um, yeah, which is mind blowing to me. He's he's pretty smart. Um, <laughs> That's very smart. Um, and then, yeah, I mean. I, like I remember lots of stuff from home, essentially, like that's what it was for me, because I grew up there from zero to 18, pretty much. Um, and yeah, I can tell you where I grew up, the food is the best. Which region, which province did you grow up in? Um, Sichuan province. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so they, they've got all the spicy food. Um, I was going to say. Yeah. It's a little bit different because, you know, New Zealand cuisine isn't particularly a spicy cuisine. No. I mean, most of what I know about New Zealand cuisine is like people do roasts and then yep. there's fish and chips. <laughs> um. But, I mean, here we've got lots of restaurants from all over the world. So, like, there's good Turkish food, good Indian food, lots of good Chinese restaurants here as well, actually. Especially in right. Auckland. There's, like, a big Chinese population in Auckland. Uh, I've actually been to the Chinatown in Auckland and right. had Szechuan food. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was fantastic. Spicy. Yeah. Real spicy, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> um, all right. Well, before we uh, before we get into maybe, like, the larger 
Auckland, New Zealand scene, which I'd love to know a little bit more about. Let's let's hear a song. Uh, I believe the first one up is OK, OK. Mm-hmm. Could tell us about it. Yeah. Well, this is one of those funny songs that like the writing of it really didn't take very long. A lot of the time I find myself uh, agonizing over the writing of a song for like months. But this one mm. came out in pretty much half an hour. Um, I sent it to my brother and I was like, what do you think of this? And he was like, there's a lot of lyrics, but it's good. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> since then it hasn't changed. <laughs> Man, brothers always have a way to give a comment where you're like, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for that, bro. <laughs> um, all right, well, here we go. How to Escape Reality. Uh, okay, okay, live here on Snacky Tunes on heritageradionetwork.org. Sorry to say I don't like your taste in music. Oh. Favorite songs, you know, I hate them. Can't relate to all the words they say. I don't want to waste my life away singing the same old words over again. Yeah. 
Sorry to say I don't like your taste in music All your favorite songs, you know That was great. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. <laughs> hearing it and for all of your fans who, who want to see you live, I'm sure it's a bit of a tease, but I'm glad that we can get at least a couple of live songs on for them today. Yes, yeah, um, So being our first, I would say, indie band from New Zealand, can you share a little bit of what the, the scene is like over there? Is it insular? I mean, obviously I know that touring and coming in is like a whole different world now, but maybe even mm-hmm. pre pandemic, what was it like? Did a lot of bands come over or is it just, uh, you know, a circulation of like New Zealand, Australian bands, things like that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting here because the population of New Zealand is quite small for how big the country mm-hmm. is. Cause I mean, it's pretty much the same size as the United Kingdom in terms of land mass as far as sure. I can tell, but population is only like four or 5 million. Um, so Music, like the music scene is interesting here like there's not like tons of bands oh um, i wouldn't call it so much a scene as far as i can tell like there's a few <laughs> pretty prominent artists who do well but um i don't know it's kind of hard because i don't have much of a reference i get the impression right. that in america there's like scenes and like there's lots of bands like making noise and it's awesome but it's probably like romanticizing it a bit <laughs> um yeah I, th- I think every town has its its pockets and its scene and even here in the states you have you know the san gabriel valley punk scene and then mm-hmm. there's you know scenes on the west side and 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 then you go to smaller cities and they, oh, they have an indie scene or not there's under scene or there's a good hip-hop scene but yeah i mean there's a lot of music here you know, there's a, there's a lot, and the thing is that there's enough towns enough where you can tour it and mm-hmm. go get at least enough gas from going from city to city, which yeah. doesn't sound like maybe the the case in in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily. It seems like there's lots of disconnect. It feels mm. like so trying to tour is is difficult, but I think a lot of it also depends on like your financial backing and stuff. And so, like for us we're just working on how much money we have, which is also not very much because we're studying. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's kind of hard getting a name out of there sometimes. Um, yeah, you, could always, like, you could always tell the bands who had parents that were helping them. You're like, that is a nice van. Yeah. <laughs> that is a nice van. And you are like the third opener. Okay. 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 Not bad. Yeah. Well, like not if bad. you've got, it really helps to have like some, connections that maybe your parents had or something that's also good oh yeah (laughs) but yeah i mean that's just how it works we do our thing Mm -hmm. it's fun um in terms of like international bands coming over it's actually kind of sad because not that many actually make it over here even if they go over to australia like not many of them really make the jump over to new zealand as well because in all likelihood Mm -hmm. they're only going to play like one or two shows anyway like international bands usually just go to Auckland and maybe Wellington. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I saw, I've seen a couple of good bands here. Like I saw Mayday Parade in mm. Auckland. That was fun. That's um, great. I could, oh, we got tickets for My Chemical Romance, but that got postponed twice. So. Speaking my language, they're going back on tour next year. I'm buying some tickets myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because I was, you know, sort of my heyday, I think I'm a little bit older than you, of going to shows like late 90s, early 2000s. And it's just been unbelievable to see that sound come back. And I definitely mm-hmm. hear a lot of that influence in your music and your band's music. What, as a as a as someone who's younger than I am, someone who's making music now, what is drawing you to that sound? Like, look, I mean, I saw Mad Chemical Romance when I was maybe 
maybe 20 years ago in my 20s. Mm-hmm. And so to even be talking about them as like, oh, yeah, we're both going to go see them maybe sometime <laughs> this year is a wild thing. Uh, yeah. What draws you to that? Why do you, why do you, what makes you want to make music like that? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Cause I, like, I can't say it's from going to live shows because <laughs> right. firstly I was, I was too young, but also like none of those bands went to China anyway. So sure. So yeah, I mean my, like most of my influence in music isn't actually from live music. It's more from mm. the, re- like the studio recordings or videos of live music, I guess. And so my first memory of getting into rock music was, listening to 70s rock music essentially that my dad loved and he'd play on Mm. like at home and so I think that kind of meant for me I never worried about like when music was coming out I wasn't interested in whether it was the newest thing I just wanted something that I thought sounded good and so when I was 12 in like 2010 I found a bunch of music that was released in like 2003 2005 you know and it didn't matter to me that it was old or whatever. It just sounded sure. awesome. Um, and so for as long as I can remember, I was listening to like 2000s rock music, essentially lots of my chemical romance. I mean, when I was younger, there was also just like, like pop punk stuff, like good Charlotte was my sure. jam. That was awesome. Hey man, <laughs> hey, we all, we all have our roots. Yeah. I mean, I, I cut my teeth on Blink-182 at the Warp Tour. So it's, you know, oh, it's, yeah. it's a good foundation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but that's an interesting thing because, at least in the States, you're like, all right, I'm into this band because they're putting out new stuff and they're touring and so I can go see them. But if the idea of like, oh, well, I'm never going to see them, so it doesn't even matter if it's out now or if it's out from 15 years ago is freeing in some ways. Where you're just yeah. like, I'm just going to find the good stuff that I like and it doesn't matter about the relevancy of, of now. Yeah, exactly. It's just... I have this huge collection of music that I just genuinely love listening to. And most of it is stuff I'll probably never see live, which is pretty sad. I mean, the amount of times that I found bands Mm. and then they broke up right afterwards. I mean, like I said, with My Chemical Romance, like they broke up a couple years after I started listening to them. Um, Brand New is another band that I really like. Um, And they were pretty much not doing anything when I started listening to them. And then they suddenly released science fiction. I was like, yes. And then you know, stopped again. Um, and that's just how it goes. <laughs> I mean, that's the great thing about bands now. And I think on the other side of the pandemic is they'll tour because bands don't die anymore. There is no breakup. They just stop and then they'll get back together one day. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, all right, let's hear another song. Uh, Falling Away. What's the story behind this track? Um, well, this was the first song I ever wrote, actually. I was like mm. 16. Um, and I just, I just come back from like a service trip to the Philippines. We were just like helping, helping out cause we were in like a really poor area and they were building a school and stuff. Um, and then I went back to my normal life in China, just going to my school and I found it to be really difficult to like transition back into that. Uh, I felt like. Like I wasn't doing anything meaningful, I guess. And I was, this song is kind of like about that struggle with that, I guess. And like feeling like China was my home, but then I moved back and I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> mm. If that makes sense. Um, it, it a hundred percent does. Um, high escape reality falling away live here on snacky tunes on hrn.org. Mm.
come back again. Thank you so much. Very great. First song. Wow. Yeah. So many, so many times you're like, I got a couple of songs. They're buried in a box under a tree. There's a boulder <laughs> dropped on that tree. And then that, that whole thing is just hidden out in the desert. So there's, you'll never. There's a couple of those for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean that song falling away, like, I don't know. It, it like there were parts of it that just really stuck to me and i was like it's it's changed a little bit over the years but it was one of the songs i couldn't let go of so i just made it better <laughs> amazing um so i know you were talking about china right before the break and you've talked about how it's influenced your music how how has it influenced the band and your creative process or the way that you approach songwriting. Are there any Chinese music influences in your music or is there just more of a thought process? Um, I'd say it probably has more, more influence on like the meaning. Cause we always write like from our experience and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of my experience is, well, yeah, I mean, growing up there and kind of, there's an identity thing, right? Cause I'm from New Zealand, sure. but I grew up in China. And so there's, I don't really feel like I'm from New Zealand, but I can't really feel like I'm from China either. Growing up there, like it's pointed out to you all the time. You're, uh, you look different, you know, <laughs> just mm -hmm. fine. Um, but that's just how it goes, you know? Um, and then moving over here when I was 18, like that was a pretty big struggle as well. It's just, yeah. Like you leave all your friends behind and they all go to America or Korea, mm. or they stay in China, right? And we're on the other side of the world. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, and so like the biggest influence I say is the meaning in the lyrics and stuff. That's where a lot of it comes from. Um, in terms of musically, like there's a few Chinese bands that I listen to, but for the most part, I didn't know of like Chinese rock music that was happening in my city. And so I didn't like go see any of those bands either. So I kind of, again, like mostly found American or British music. Um, mm. Yeah. But I'd say in certain songs, there's a bit of a Chinese sound to them. I guess there's like a certain Chinese music uses the pentatonic scale quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's elements of that in a few of, a few of our songs, I think probably more yeah. so in a couple of songs that haven't actually been released yet. <laughs> well, 
Let's um, talk about releases. Um, we talked about the EP, but you also put out a really great Christmas track, <laughs> which uh, was really fun. And I would say uh, a time honored tradition for the indie rock, punk rock scenes of the world yeah. <laughs> is putting out your Christmas single. Um, what was the song? How did it come about? Why did you want to throw your hat into the uh, Christmas time canon? of the punk indie world <laughs> that is a fantastic question um i mean sometimes i don't know why <laughs> 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 no i mean basically my friend mason who actually lives in la now he he was in china with us when we were kids um he sent me these lyrics and he was like bro you got to do a christmas song and i liked i liked the lyrics so i was like okay um i'll just see what i come up with and it was probably the most fun I've had writing a song because the whole thing was like, how do we make this sound like Christmas? Mm. And I, I love Christmas personally. So it's just, I don't know. It was a lot of fun. Um, Cause usually when I'm writing, I'm like, how can I make this sound awesome? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, how can I add new, like new layers to the meaning of this and all this kind of stuff. Um, whereas with this, it was like, let's just make this fun. Let's mm. draw influence from the most like pop punk of things that we can. And that's just what we did. Um, yeah. I'd say personally, my favorite part is the guitar solo. Cause that's like, Oh, it's a great. It's yeah. A great... I mean like it's got all the cheese, but it's amazing. <laughs> In writing something like that. Cause I, I, I know that you're working on the full length and mm -hmm. giving yourself that freedom just to have fun and not just be like, let's just make it loud and shred. Are you going to, take that to your songwriting process? Are you going to, because it's a good song. You've had good results. You got some good press on it. Like, does it give you some more freedom with the, the more regular part of your canon? Mm, I think so. Oh, that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about it too much. <laughs> um, probably in the future, I think like, cause we've already written the songs for this full, full length album and we're kind of we're almost done recording actually we just need to do vocals and acoustic guitars um so it probably won't affect that very much but i think in the future yeah like we're trying to as a band just take a bit more of a chilled out view of things <laughs> sure for, for like a lot of my adulthood i've kind of been stressed out about this music thing. I like want to make it work. And I think in the last year I've kind of realized the reason I wanted to do it was because it was fun. Mm. So let's actually try and make it fun again. And if it works, then great. And if it doesn't, then at least we're having fun, you know? You know, I found in so many times that when you take that approach, it starts to work out in the mm -hmm. long run. And when can people expect the album? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um we're not exactly sure on the date yet um once i once we finish recording vocals we'll know but i'd say definitely this year it'll come out well it's recorded now so we're holding you to it awesome <laughs> <laughs> kidding um well listen i, I want to make sure we have enough time for one more song but if people want to check out the music uh support you guys get the ep hear the Christmas anthem. We'll call it an anthem. <laughs> sure. Um, where can they check your stuff out? Um, so our stuff is on all the streaming platforms and everything. If you just search how to escape reality, it should come up. But I mean, if you want to support us, um, like financially or whatever, we have everything on Bandcamp as pay what you want. And so if you want to actually pay for the music, then feel free to do, do that. Otherwise... You can also just have it for free. We don't really care. <laughs> yeah. And like follow us on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. Again, if you just search how to escape reality, it should come up. Sweet. Shout out to Bandcamp. Making it oh, work. Yeah. yeah. They're awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have one last song in the ground live. Thank you. How to escape reality. We appreciate you making the time. Thanks for sitting around for Snacky Tunes. We'll see you next week here on heritageradionetwork.org. 
Love is like depression, anxiety. Love's just another disorder in our brains. So hard to let it go. I remember when they said give everything, but they never warned about the trips to your grave. I found out on my own.
We talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. This program is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please... Join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.